no music at the moment. Yes. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this um, session on metamaterial in healthcare. Um, my name is Mehdi Tavakoli from the health team at KTN. Myself and my colleague um, Matt Chapman are managing this uh, session. Uh, we will be having um, four presentation, about 15 minutes each, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. And, uh, could I ask you any questions you may have as um, our speaker present? You put them in the Q&A section and we will pick them up and, and address them as much as we can. I just wanted to uh, announce that as, as you know, that the session will be recorded and the recording will be available later on uh, at KTN website. And in terms of the, um, uh, speakers, um, there will be um, four, one starting from an industry perspective and then following three from uh, academic institution universities. So I was going to start um, the first one without further ado to give them as much time um, as possible. Uh, Dr. Uh, Timos um, Kalos, who is from the Meta Material Inks and um, Timos is the co-founder and CSO of the Metamaterial. And his, the title of his presentation is Application of Metamaterial Next Generation Healthcare and Biosensing. Um, back to you, Timos, please start, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and thank you for the invitation here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, uh, Chief Science Officer for uh, uh, Meta Materials. Uh, so we, and I'm going to present today about our applications in uh, healthcare and biosensing systems. Um, I'll try to be uh, quick and efficient. Uh, because we're a public company, I, I need to put out a disclaimer that there will be some forward looking statements. Uh, that uh, are involving significant, <coughs> uh, you know, information, but uh, the actual results uh, could differ from what you see uh, here from the information. Um, so my outline of the talk is uh, I'll talk a little bit about our company, then about our applications. Uh, then I'm going to more specifically uh, highlight some medical applications we're working on, on medical sensing, and then I'll uh, uh, dig down a bit deeper into uh, two specific applications, MRI enhancement and uh, non-invasive glucose sensing, and I'll wrap up with some comments on uh, pathways to market for medical devices. Our inspiration has been uh, Richard Feynman, personally, who in 1959, he, he made this talk about the future of nanotechnology, and basically he said that he couldn't see at the time uh, how things would happen, but he envisioned that when we have control of arrangement of things in the small scale, uh, we'll get a much greater range of possible properties that substances can have. So that was over uh, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years. And I think the metamaterials and nanotechnology embody this spirit of uh, Feynman's comments uh, at the time. Uh, very briefly, you know, our, our company was founded in, um, you know, 2011. We were inspired by the early works of Pendry and Smith and, and the others in the field. And with our 
CEO and co-founder George. Uh, we started the company in, in UK and 10 years later, we're now the first uh, metamaterial company listed on, on NASDAQ. Um, we present ourselves as this, in a sense, the Sherlock Holmes of light. So when you have an unusual problem with electromagnetic uh, waves and heat and energy, then customers come to us for, for a solution. And we, in most cases, we use metamaterials, uh, although in all, not in all of them, to, to tackle them. Uh, we still have the original office in the UK. Our headquarters are in Halifax in Nova Scotia on the eastern seaboard of Canada. Uh, but there are also various locations and representatives we have uh, around the world. We're, uh, we crossed 100 people uh, last year and uh, we keep uh, growing. Uh, I'll mention two exam example applications, non-medical, uh, that we work on. So we have a product for sale which is targeted at pilots. It's notch filters holographic uh, for uh, filtering out green lasers and protecting the pilots. Uh, these are targeted for the aviation industry. Um, we also have in-house capability to print uh, you know, security features in things like banknotes and also for tickets. Uh, you know, if, if you happen to have a, a Euro Cup ticket, you know, last summer it had one of our features on it, uh, on the physical ticket uh, itself. Um, and we do that using nano imprint uh, lithography. On the medical side specifically, uh, we have a few applications in our uh, roadmap. Um, so from uh, left to right, uh, so on the left we have RadioWise, which is our medical imaging application in MRI. I'm going to explain a bit more on that. Uh, Mama is a technology for imaging breast and brain, actually, for uh, the insides of the body. Uh, Glucowise is, is our non-invasive glucometer, and we also have uh, planning for a consumer molecular um, biosensor application. So these are the areas and applications we are interested in. That. Uh, to provide a, a bit more detail on the, uh, we develop films. Uh, that have uh, specific optical patterns on them. And it's basically a very compact uh, spectrometer in a sense that can be used for Raman spe spectroscopy. And uh, we're also able to offer soon like SERS uh, substrates in order to enhance the, uh, the wavelengths and light emitted by, uh, you know, this type of instruments. And this is a basically an affordable replacement of the conventional high-end source substrates integrated with an optical core into a single uh, package that we envision in a, in a compact device. Um, another uh, application on the biosensing side is compact microscopy for fluorescence and color imaging. So what we do here is basically we, we go into an optical microscope used for uh, you know, uh, fluorescence and detection, and we insert this uh, combiner waveguide. So this is a flat optic element with uh, specifically designed uh, holographic gratings in order to couple a light source in, then transport it and exit it uh, along the objective uh, path. And this is a, this can offer a much more compact setup than what's traditionally used in, uh, in microscopes. So there are combination of technologies here that can result uh, in, in compactifying the, the whole setup. Uh, this can also be applied to smartphone in order to compactify the, the, op the optics for thin imaging applications. Uh, another application, this is the MamaWise I, I mentioned previously. So here, uh, we use metasurface antenna. So we place a metasurface pattern, pattern in front of an antenna. The antenna is placed around the brain in this case. And uh, we use uh, radio wave imaging. So this is a traditional technique uh, to image with microwaves the inside of the body. 
so we're using these algorithms, but we're enhancing them, the hardware, by adding the metasurface. And we've shown recently using both radar imaging and tomography techniques that uh, in phantom, so there is this is a slice of a brain, and inside we have like a, what would be a, a tumor or a stroke uh, area. And we saw that when you add the metasurface, you are able to better locate an image uh, that area. Uh, so we're building now a, a radio wave imaging system for the brain around uh, this main idea and concept. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about the MRI uh, application. So uh, in MRI, as you might know, there are uh, there is a static magnetic field and also RF uh, high power radio waves that uh, cause the proton spin to flip. And then as they turn back, uh, they can create an image uh, that is being picked up by an, an antenna, basically. Uh, our goal here is to increase the signal to noise ratio in one and a half uh, Tesla scans and also uh, separately improve the signal to noise ratio and the homogenization in three Tesla scans. Uh, this use three Tesla scans use higher frequencies, there are more dark spots there. And basically, we're creating an accessory. Uh, device that is passive can be added during the imaging process and can improve the image quality, especially in long scans like the spine. Uh, on the bottom right here, you can see uh, images collected without and with the metamaterial device that shows an enhancement in this example, imaging the ankle, ankle on the foot. Um, this is a much earlier prototype we had developed uh, just to give you the, the main concept, which is this uh, parallel wires that when embedded in a high, high permittivity material like water or ceramic, uh, then you shrink down and can make their length match the wavelength of the electromagnetic uh, radiation, which is for example, 64 megahertz for one and a half Tesla. Um, we have tested this in uh, early stage human studies. Uh, we were able to show increased signal to noise ratio enhancement, uh, also improve the uniformity. And uh, this all was happening without additional heating, uh, which is a big issue in the MRI machines. Uh, just to give you a quick idea, so maybe we focus at the, at the bottom triplet of pictures. Uh, so. On the left is an image collected uh, you know, without the metamaterial device. And then on the right is the same exact uh, scan, but when adding the device. So you can see clearly here that there is a huge enhancement in the signal to noise ratio that is a very uh, of high interest to clinicians. Um, let me move on and talk about another application, non-invasive uh, glucose sensing. You might be aware here that uh, uh, if you have abnormal glucose levels, uh, the so-called type 1 diabetes patients have to uh, collect blood, usually from their fingers, uh, up to 8 to 10 times a day if it's a serious condition. And uh, this is inserted now currently into a strip. There is a chemical reaction that creates a voltage difference. Uh, this is a very painful process. And there are hundreds of millions of people that uh, have to do this. And there'll be more than half a billion people suffering with diabetes uh, in the coming years. So our vision here is to replace this with a non-invasive solution. We are planning for three form factors from left to right, depending how frequent you want to, um, to be um, sampling. So on the left is a desktop device. This is targeted for point of care, single point uh, locations like clinics or at home. Uh, we have plans for a portable uh, device. Uh, so this is a semi-continuous, this is similar to the most current glucose monitors that can give you readings on the go. And we also envision integrating this technology eventually to a, to a smartwatch uh, and can be used for uh, glucose, but also other vital signs. 
There are two novel technology aspects here. One is uh, non-meta materials, the idea of combining data from optical and radio frequency sensors. Here you see an image from an earlier prototype we had uh, uh, developed. So we use both data streams in order to predict glucose levels. And in addition to that, we're integrating into the systems uh, an impedance matching film. So it's an anti-reflection coating for the skin specifically that can enhance uh, the penetration of the signal. So it's thin, it can be integrated into the device. Uh, it can be designed for optical or radio wave signals uh, or both. And we can get up to 250% uh, higher signal uh, inside. Um, I don't want to drag this too long, so I'm going to skip a couple of these slides just to show you that this has been tested in both animals and humans. Uh, in this example here, we uh, it was a pig ears and we we're detecting glucose levels changes non-invasively while using the, the metamaterial mm -hmm. film. And we were able to show that there is an enhancement uh, at 60 gigahertz uh, when the metamaterial is inserted. Two and minutes, we've also two minutes, done- Two minutes, two minutes late, yeah? yeah. Thank you, thank you. And we've also done in, um, uh, in human tissue with similar uh, results, there is a strong enhancement uh, two and a half times when the metamaterial film is inserted. And we're now in the process of integrating this into the, uh, the devices. Um, let me close off on what uh, some advice or what it would take to commercialize a medical device. And I'll be more specific to the FDA here. Uh, so if people are thinking, I, mean, okay, I want to do something in the medical space, there are some basics they need to have in, in mind. So number one is uh, the device needs to be classified depending on the risk. Typically there is class one, low risk device. These are usually consumables like gloves. Uh, there is a moderate, moderate risk device and also class three, which is high risk. Uh, that's usually for devices that uh, will penetrate uh, into the, tissue. And the FDA offers different pathways. Um, the most common one is the, the so-called 510K. So there are about 4,000 applications per year, and it would cost about 30 million to get to, to through the regulatory process, $30 million. There is a much more stringent one in the case that your device is completely new, the technology is new, called PMA pre-market approval. These are much fewer, maybe 100 per year, and the costs are much higher because you need to do a lot more testing and clinical trials. And there are also devices that are exempt. Usually if it's something very simple, like our meta eyewear are a class one medical device that are exempt for, uh, from a regulatory path. And finally, I'll close off by saying that uh, Early on in the development of medical device, whether metamaterial or not, there is a control cycle that needs to be implemented if you want to have any chance. So there are certain stages here. You start with the concept design, planning the design, the product design, then you verify it, you validate it, then you transfer it to production. And in all this, there is a, a very well structured and quality management process that needs to be integrated in the development of the device. So you cannot just do the development and then decide, okay, I'll just do that now and launch the device. You need, these systems need to be included early on at the start of the development, which is something we've been doing as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Timos. Um, very interesting um, presentation. Thank you. I think it's very important to um, look at the commercial aspects of use of mater materials in, in healthcare. I think you, um, in the main theme of these sessions, you covered most of it in terms of biosensing sensors, some of the treatment area and imaging. So I think we're gonna continue with our next presenters. We'll come back to you to almost at the end mm -hmm. with some question. Thank you again. So the next presenter is Dr. Afar Karimola. He's from College of Sciences and Engineering, University of Glasgow. And the title of his presentation, Disposable Plasmonics for Sensing. Um, Afar, back to you. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thank you very much for having me over on this uh, uh, conference. Um, here we go. Uh, so the I'm from University of Glasgow, uh, and uh, we basically, um, uh, again, like, like most universities, do lots of different kinds of research. My group in particular is very much linked to plasmonics. And for the past seven years, roughly, it's been quite linked to uh, chiral plasmonics. So today um, I will sort of, uh, sort of just wanted to show this to anyone who's not from the UK where Glasgow is. Quite often people think everything's down south here, uh, but actually this is in Scotland um, and it's one of the oldest universities. Now, um, trying to keep away from very academic kind of talks. I just want to sort of discuss uh, what we've kind of made and how we've sort of been looking at applying it into something which is commercially relevant. Um, we came up with these sort of devices that we can mass manufacture, uh, plasmonic uh, sort of nanostructures, um, which is one of the limiting factors for a lot of nanotechnology uh, coming out in this particular field. Um, but there's just two applications that I will focus on. One is the biosensing that we'll be uh, talking about. And the second is gonna be a bit about how we use them for something relatively new that we've discovered, which could have some big impact in the commercial side and pharmaceuticals and how we do quality assurance testing of chemicals. Um, and that's gonna be using some Raman spectroscopy. Um, apart from that, our particular group is quite uh, good at adept at sort of uh, doing simulations, understanding plasmonics, and we apply those techniques to various things such as uh, laser heating nanostructures and how you can actually use that for novel fabrication or chemistries. Um, and also how we can optimize uh, plasmonics for security uh, based uh, technologies. So the biosensing kind of started as obviously um, something, uh, uh, a very typical application uh, our collaborators were involved in. And when we made these certain structures, this was the first stuff we looked at. But the long-term aim for me has always been to sort of, what's the purpose of this particular biosensor? And current chemical assays quite often still being used are very much sort of hands-on. They're quite dependent on uh, putting on sort of primary antibodies, you then put in the particular molecule you're looking for, like a disease marker, for instance, and you usually have to end up with uh, a, a, a additional molecule being stuck on, which also has fluorescence or some sort of uh, recognition element. So this is a labeling mechanism. You have to put a label on the uh, final uh, system. And this is quite typical of how ELISA uh, works. Now, uh, Tanos also mentioned some new kind of biosensor technology coming out for sort of uh, more easier work. There are quite a few other companies that have been looking at different technologies apart from metamaterials to try and solve the solution. And the biggest problem with this current methodology is still the, the sample sizes are large. You don't want to use that much material. Um, you know, the, the washing time, et cetera, all of this adds lots of steps. And of course, this means you need somebody who's got lots of expertise. And we wanted to make a system that would just literally be like an espresso of diagnostics. You go, you put your chip, the chip says, well, I can detect 10 different things in your sample. And it's not just for clinical. This is very much aimed at scientists doing discovery for different new drug compounds, et cetera. They would use such machines on a regular basis. And one of the current technologies is surface plasmon resonance. It's been there for two decades now. Uh, it's a very widely used uh, technique. And what we feel is that what we're putting out here is like the evolution of surface plasmon resonance uh, um, systems. Um, we wanted to make the system seamless to transition from doing your testing or, or development part of your assay or your te medical test to producing a system where you could just simply use the same chemistry, same compound, same methodology and produce a point of care uh, kind of uh, system as well. You just use it on as a cartridge. So the same cartridge you use for doing the uh, testing or uh, uh, research, you would use the same thing for your point of care. Um, we also, with SPR systems, they have all these flow systems and they need liquid flow. There's lots of controls, how they detect when the liquid changes and things. And what we've done is we made a very simple system where you don't require any uh, flow. Now uh, we can just pipette samples in and out and we use very small amounts of it. 
Um, it's label free, so less amount of material required. And of course, they're low cost. So SPR chips still in the cost about 100, 200 pounds sometimes, uh, depending which company you're working with. And that makes people reuse their samples. And if anyone's done a lot of biochemical experiments, you know you don't like to reuse. It's just another problem uh, as part of your experimentation or development process. Um, and so we made something which is disposable. So it would cost less than five pounds. You throw it away after each test and then you go forward. Now we've designed a sort of instrument. This is the current sort of prototype we've been using and I'm gonna show some results just to show it all works. Um, and we've been designing an instrument and this is still too large. Uh, had some interns design this and I still feel they didn't really understand the uh, impact of uh, having a compact system. Um, but it can definitely be made into like one fourth the size of it. And our envision sort of sensor is just basically taking these sort of chips that we have, these templated plasmonic chips and packaging them to be some sort of cartridge system. Okay, so now the manufacturing process was one of the big things and this uh, started off, uh, I think 2012, 2011 maybe. Um, and it uses the similar process for developing Blu-rays. Um, now the Blu-ray process is of course quite well known. We understand how to do a lot of uh, the process, what kind of implications engineering wise that we have, um, but we've optimized it for nanostructures. So we can create structures which have the sort of indentations in a plastic surface, which can have something like about 20 nanometer, 30 nanometer sort of arm widths quite repeatable, very, very repeatable. And we make like a thousand of these in a day that for us, of course, they last for a long time, but it's highly mass manufacturable. Um, just quickly, that's the structure we'll be looking at. I won't go into detail. Um, and that's one of the pretty looking slides that we've uh, produced over the years. Now, um, we can create the sample in such a way that you can sort of have multiple sites, you can coat them with multiple different chemical compounds and therefore detect different markers for disease. Um, I won't go into the technical details of how we do measurements, uh, this is just not enough time, but essentially what we can do is multiplex things. So that means if I want to detect multiple viruses uh, in this uh, sample, either for medical reasons or just for research reasons, I can potentially do nine different protein binders on the surface and therefore create a system where you can detect multiple disease markers or the diseases themselves directly. Um, just a quick go over what the system is. It's, it's, this can be a lot more compact. Again, it's a prototype and it's a very simple sort of microscope kind of design uh, where you've got a monochromator light and we basically measure a whole spectrum in under five minutes we can obviously make that a lot quicker and optimize that depending on the applications. Just a quick, uh, uh, some of the results to show how we do multiplexing. In this particular case, we have two types of molecules stuck on the top part and two at the bottom. And they're supposed to only particularly detect uh, antibodies uh, against their, uh, they're the targets essentially. They've been stuck on the surface and they will detect antibodies that may exist in your sample. Uh, and we would do this sequentially just to sort of showcase that they are being very selective in what they're binding to. So in this case, we've got an S1 protein, which is what you have in coronavirus. Uh, quite often, this is the thing that actually interacts with our cells and then causes the disease to spread. Uh, and you've got something very commonly streptavidin. This is uh, a protein that connects to vitamin B essentially in our bodies. And you can see that when we introduce just the antibody for streptavidin, it only raises the signal for that. And when we introduce uh, as, uh, the antibody for the coronavirus, for instance, then you only see uh, an increase of that. So we've just been uh, going to be publishing all of this soon as uh, some simple things to show um, that the overall multiplexing on this works quite well. Now, one thing we've been looking at is uh, viruses. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why we want to look at multiple viruses in a single experiment is because there's still a lack of tools there to, to study on the large scale of what kind of viruses are spreading. For a long time, we've just been saying, oh, influenza, flu, it's there. Okay, take a flu shot. Next year, we go ahead. But as the pandemic's kind of shown us, we kind of need more information of what's actually in the population. Um, so there are companies that are still quite strongly based around PCR, looking at detecting multiple viruses in samples. Uh, but going, it through, going through such simple processes like what we have, where you don't have to do PCR, but it's a bit more fast because of that, 
you directly detect the viruses um, and it, it will help us sort of quantify uh, potentially of not just what's in the sample, but let's say if we were to do this for over a large area, multiple uh, over a population, we'd know a little better about what kind of viruses are in that uh, region. Just to show why this is important is because different regions actually have different sort of compositions of the viruses that are affecting people. And it actually changes when you're from, a, from the age you're in. So children are affected by different viruses and adults are actually affected more by different viruses. And this should help us uh, improve how we understand our public health essentially. So we looked at some uh, coronavirus recently over the last year, um, and we tried to see, well, can the overall concept work? There's still a lot of work to be done. You can see these small spots, they're actually the coronavirus uh, stuck to the surface. Um, clearly we can have a lot more, um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of chemistry involved to achieving all of that. And the sensor, uh, when we introduced the SARS virus uh, in concentrated form, we could see the solution. Uh, so sorry, the change in the signal and uh, it's later sort of reduced. So we're trying to understand why it's reducing. But even then, if you've introduced a sample and you see such a large specific change, that's enough to uh, help us detect it. So our next steps are to try and see if we can multiplex multiple viruses. We looked at influenza as well uh, as one of the things we're going to try and multiplex. So we try and create a sim uh, system where you can detect uh, influenza and SARS and uh, rhinovirus or RSV uh, as well. And uh, so we tried that and we got similar kind of results with influenza as well. So we think it's relatively successful. There are a few things on the type of virus, et cetera, where we found information that you get based on the type of virus. So this is plant virus, it's uh, physical sort of morphology is slightly different. Okay. Um, one thing we've been famous for is actually using chirality. I won't go into too much detail, but this is to do with structural changes in proteins. This is important when studying how drugs interact with specific targets in the body, for instance. In this case, this is a weed killer. Uh, so we, you add the weed killer in and you sort of see changes in structure. But this is a very complex and we are trying to sort of make that as part of the system an add-on feature in the future potentially but it's not that trivial to, to achieve, especially for repeatability. But that's why we've got chiral nanostructures because that's what it will allow in the future, but also they provide much better signal responses. So they're much better, uh, easier to measure and then actually uh, do the automation of the whole system to tell you just the data that what the peak shifts are, et cetera. Okay, so the last bit that I'll just quickly run over is the latest stuff we've done. We can use these nanostructures to actually do Raman, surface enhanced Raman, as Thamos mentioned in one of his uh, earlier slides as well. We do surface enhanced Raman with these, but we actually have a special coating on top of it, which allows us uh, to, to create a much higher surface signal. And also the chirality comes into play. So you, we've got uh, molecules, quite a, quite a lot of them, especially drugs, exist as handed stuff. So there's uh, a left-handed molecule and there's a right-handed molecule. And as right. thalidomide- Two, minute, two minutes, okay. yeah, thank you. As thalidomide uh, showed us, it's very important to, uh, thalidomide was a very famous drug that caused lots of problems in women in pr their pregnancy. And it, as it showed us that knowing which hand is, uh, handedness of that molecule is being used as the drug is extremely important. So currently pharmaceuticals will be looking um, doing a lot of work and trying to know, uh, you know, quantify what handedness of the molecules are in their uh, final production and how they can optimize their systems to develop only one of them. Um, and this technique we've used, uh, we basically can quantify down to very low concentrations, which handedness we essentially have. Um, I, I will just go through this very quickly, but uh, basically you can sort of uh, calibrate the system and you can also use it to find out that if you have a mixture of the two-handed uh, uh, molecules, how much of it potentially you have, once the system's calibrated, you can actually use that to find out what is the percentage of one-handed over the other. And we've used it with multiple, not just cysteine, but this is thalidomide actually, and we can see massive differences when we put this on, and we can use that for uh, enantiomeric specific sort of Brahman that does not exist at the moment um, much. I'd just like to quickly thank uh, the students who've worked on this and my uh, colleagues, Alexi and Olga, who've been uh, very much uh, the ones leading the work on the Raman side. 
uh, and Malcolm and Nikolai, who've been long-term collaborators, uh, and of course, were the ones who sort of took all of this started with me uh, back in 2013. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention. Thanks very much for a very interesting presentation again. I hope we'll come back to some of the questions during the Q&A. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, remind our delegates that uh, they could use the Q&A box um, and put their question in. And then if they could name the person the question for, we try to cover it as much as we can during the Q&A session, if not, you will ask our speaker to respond to them after the event, uh, if you can. So the third presentation before the last one by Professor Vatgama is gonna be by Dr. Dmitry uh, Kovshyov. Um, he is um, from University of Hull and the topic of his presentation mm -hmm. is new nanostructure carbons with potential for healthcare technology applications. Um, back to you, Dmitry. Thank you very much, Matthew, for introduction. Thank you for having me uh, on this conference. So hopefully you can see my screen. Can you? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, great. So um, the topic and title, obviously, for my presentation today is you know, structured carbons with potential for healthcare technologies application, or should I speaking for healthcare application. So just a little bit of background. So basically um, my fields of expertise are covering mainly oil gas uh, conversion utilization. And for quite a number of years, more than 25 by now, uh, we are working quite actively in the area of uh, catalytic hydrocarbons utilization decomposition, when as a raw material you can have uh, different type of hydrocarbons, including natural gas. Obviously you need to have a catalyst, everything will go to a reactor. And as an outcome, you will have hydrogen, you will have nanostructured carbons, not amorphous, not pyrolytic. And so you will have extra stream here, methane. Okay, and uh, um, the process itself could be driven such way that uh, hydrogen could be the primary target. And this leads to quite a number of applications. This will help an industrial partner to meet uh, a zero carbon target uh, or other way around where we will produce through the same reactor with use of different conditions, different catalytic systems. We will produce high quality nanostructured graphite materials. And this in particular uh, will cover applications, high-end applications as a battery, electrodes, catalyst supported, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, including filters and fillers. So um, speaking more specifically about uh, healthcare application of nanostructured carbons, I would like to call attention that for the moment, based on what is published and what we have tried, uh, there are three main types of nanostructured carbons are uh, involved in healthcare applications. First one is the carbon nanotubes where the basal planes of graphite are in parallel to an axis of a tube. And uh, we can have surface uh, modification of a carbon nanotube. We could have a carbon nanotube impregnated with different stuff we could have use of carbon nanotube as a nano for the nano piping through a cell lipid membrane, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Other two types, they mainly refer for carbon nanofibers or filaments. And again, we can make these materials engineered at atomic level at uh, sub nano scale. And we could have basal planes, planes of carbon oriented in perpendicular to an axis of fiber or at some angle. In this particular case is called a fishbone structure. So basically you have your uh, fish with the head over here. And this is like a very uh, funny representation of this structure of nanostructured carbon. I'm calling your attention that 
this is nanoscale. This is about from normally 15 to 150 nanometers in diameter. And uh, we know for the moment that this material or this type of materials, they do have uh, a toxic effect on bio components. And the biggest problem with this is that when you have a living cell and you have a membrane, a nanoparticle can penetrate through membrane, make <coughs> sorry distortion to the inner content of the cell. From other side, for the moment, exactly the same approach is in use to do transaction when you can have your nano object uh, incrustated with whatever uh, molecular DNA you need to deliver down to a living cell. And uh, for the moment, this uh, approach is one of the key approach for quite deep biomodification of the living cell and obviously living organisms. But today I would like to talk about another structure, which for the moment is uh, not, I would say, well known. And uh, we have developed technology to produce this structure. And uh, uh, we call this structure granulated fibrous carbon. Okay, um, so what is granulated fibrous carbon? So basically straight from a reactor, uh, can we see Sorry, my drawing? Can you, can you oh. enlarge your slides? I think we've seen two, two um, images there. Two images, uh, just a moment. This, uh... Okay, this was the previous slide. Once again. Uh, if you just if you exit out of that screen, just close this, yeah. If you just say end slideshow, just a little bit further along on the left. Yep. And then down the bottom right, just next to the sort of zoom in, zoom out. There's if you just click that one. Oh, it's come. Have you got two screens? Yes. Uh, it might be pulling through. To the to the wrong one. Um, let me try this. Uh, sorry, just uh, if you just if you click on that. Oh, if you click on that, the there, three dots. Yeah. 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 And then go to hide presenter view. It might bring All it through. Right. Okay. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, let's have a try. Hmm. Or if you just if you go up to the top on the toolbar and where it says slideshow. All right. Um, no, it shows me unfortunately on 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 the on my on my second screen. That's the problem. Olivia, can you use your backup uh, copy, please? Yeah, let me just pull them up. Unforeseen problem, sorry about that. Let's see, Olivia can use her backup copies that you sent. Yeah. yeah, I will take over the sharing and I'll just push me to the right slide. Okay, this is slide number five, please. Number five. And from this slide, on this particular slide, the one has animation, and so if we could do it, this would be great. Okay, so uh, as, a, as you can see here on this slide, we are producing a new type of nanostructured carbon called granulated fibrous carbon. And this is granular size, three, five millimeters. Could be smaller, could be bigger, it does depend on the target. Uh, looking more closely on the surface and the structure of the granule, you can see that the core is very dense and this makes granule very strong mechanically. At the higher magnification, you will see that the surface, the relief is uh, very rough. And basically our investigation showed that this is mesoporous material. And so at the highest magnific magnification, you'll see that actually the surface is made from uncounting actually amount of 
carbon nanofibers and uh, type of nanofibers, morphology of the surface, uh, energy surface, the way we can, uh, should continue by the way, Olivia, and the way we can optimize and modify surface is down to every single surface to atomic level to sub nanoscale. So uh, then Olivia, let me uh, continue the presentation from my side again, if I could, uh, just to, to take over from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Right, can you see my, my screen now, yeah? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, this slide uh, represents actually the different cross sections through the granular. This is the surface, uh, your uh, left-hand side, uh, and you can see mesoporous uh, structure made from carbon nanofibers or the controllable uh, structure. Cross section, which is in the middle, you see they were quite dense uh, core and the uh, porous surface, but the core itself is uh, quite dense with the quite a number of, as we call, transport pores, again, interlinked with the carbon nanofibers. So overall, the granular structure is very strong, mechanically sound, and this uh, uh, leads to quite a number of interesting uh, application fields. So uh, speaking further about that, uh, what we found is this particular new material, and uh, this, this column is the, our material granulated fibrous carbon, uh, is perfect sorbent or cumulator for uh, big organic molecules. And I want to call your attention the difference is significant to obviously to gratify to amorphous carbon or specially designed uh, sorbent based on zeolite. So we are talking about difference 10 on the power of five, six, and in some cases, 10 on the power of eight. So this uh, means that your biocomponent, and I will talk about this in a minute, which can be enzyme, bacteria, virus, will stay on the surface of this granule. You will not lose this and kind of you can uh, make sure that uh, your biocomponent will, you'll, you'll have full control about location and uh, control uh, of even growth of your biocomponent. So what about biotoxicity? This is very important bit if you're talking about health application. So we try this material for different targets in particular for culture. And so you can see on the left-hand side here that the rhodococcus is happily growing on the surface of this uh, material. This is carbon by inert. Every single fiber is interlinked in some kind of three-dimensional network. That's why, that's why uh, biotoxicity is very low, uh, just about nothing. And uh, the biocomponents are more than happy to grow over. Other investigations showed that capacity, the amount of load, is way better than if we are talking just standalone carbon nanotube or carbon nanofiber, etc. And this is understandable because we are producing again three-dimensional structure. And first time ever, you can talk about absorption property or volume capacity of nanostructured carbon for carbon nanotubes or filament, filamentous carbon, when every single fiber is standalone. You cannot even talk about this. In our case, with this new material, uh, we have very good <coughs> absorption and uh, accumulation property for this particular component. So this is about direct application of this three-dimensional matrix of non-structured carbons. However, there are some other options how this structure can be used in particular health application. And one of the um, quite intriguing option is to use this material as a, as a 
template for uh, silica gels. So normally it's quite hard to produce silica gels just from the beginning, and it's extremely hard to produce silica gel with a controllable uh, three-dimensional structure. In our case, it is possible we're controlling structure of this uh, three-dimensional matrix of non-structured carbon. You impregnate this matrix with a precursor for silica gel. Then you do uh, uh, all what is required to turn it to the hard structure and just burn out the carbon. And then you have basically like replica of uh, three-dimensional uh, nanostructured uh, matrix, but made now from this uh, silica. And this is again a quite new and very in interesting application, we think, because this could lead for uh, other types of metamaterials to be used in, in medical applications. So, uh, key properties. <clears throat> so, we've got a couple of, of minutes, couple of minutes, two, three yeah, minutes, yeah. please. I have Thank just you. one slide okay. left. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, key properties of your left, uh, left hand side for this slide and application fields. Let me skip catalyst in organic chemistry, etc. What we found as uh, quite interesting and in some cases proven application fields is a biomaterials incubation within the matrix, biomaterials accumulation and biomaterials support. In addition to that, we just, uh, we're trying to find the collaborator to uh, have a try or for the application of this material for extended localized drug delivery, as this looks like uh, we could uh, be a winner in this field as well. And basically I have finished with the, my presentation. I'm more than happy to have your questions at the end of the Q and I session. Thank you. Yeah. Th thanks very much, Dimitri. We hopefully come back to some of the questions later on anyway. Um, and yeah. I think you managed well with, um, yeah, with your slides anyway. And um, thank you to Olivia as well. Thank you. So um, I'm going to present next presenter, which is Professor Pankaj Bhatgama. Uh, Professor Vatgama is from the Queen Mary University of London, Professor of Biomaterial, Medical Biomaterial, but he's also um, been working at uh, Barton London Hospital for some years in, as a professor of clinical uh, biochemistry. So he's got uh, the experience both on the clinical side and on the academic side. And uh, uh, the title of his presentation is that metamaterial a resource for advanced uh, diagnostic and intervention strategy strategies. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Bankaj. Back to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Tavakoli, for for that introduction. My apologies to everybody that um, I'm only only joining uh, with the last sort of one and a half speakers because I've. I do these things you academics will know called teaching, and you can't really get out of that. No, no, everything teaching is sacrosanct. Uh, well, folks, I, I'm hopefully I can give you a quick rundown of one slice of technology, which is about. Sorry, Pank, sorry Pankaj, can you um, maximize your slide? I think we'll yeah, see. Apologies. Oh, yeah, apologies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My apologies. No problem. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank, thanks for raising that. So. Um, is really to give you a glimpse of the coal phase and also in a slightly superficial way to cover some of the application areas that I personally, in my biased way, think would be worth pursuing and also to inject a bit of realism on what is going on in the research sector because I feel quite strongly about the, the need to understand the application end, not just the basic science end. So let me, in my first slide, explain to you how, what to laboratory medicine is all about, because I'm going to talk about diagnostics and a tiny, tiny bit about therapeutics. This is a picture of what, what labs are all about. First of all, in diagnostics, you have to work out what your tool is going to do. Where is it integrating into the care pathway? There is no magic mushroom materials that's going to revolutionize everything we do. It doesn't work that way. It's a systems thing. And laboratory departments, are very sophisticated things these days compared to when I was young. My lab, for example, ran 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000 assays per day in biochemistry. There is a different level 
next down is you have smaller analyzers, which are bench tops for particular targeted specialist assays. You, some of these you recognize right through to the handheld glucometer, which all of you will know about, right through in vivo ambulatory glucoses, which is something I know a bit about. My point is that it's two, three, four, which is where it probably where you can make an impact with metamaterials. The high throughput stuff is going to be very hard. This is an example of high throughput. It's a big analyzer doing immunoassays. It can run 200 immunoassays within an hour. You, you can't compete with that. This is a handheld, nurse usable, layperson usable, single drop of blood assay, which requires no manipulation. And it, it, it spews out 10 to 15 specialist assay parameters for intensive care. And this is the bench top, this is the glucometer. So these are pretty sophisticated places. And just for your fun, uh, just to show you that biochemistry has a repertoire of around two to 300, hematology much lower. Microbiology is a strange instrument light environment where you may make an impact because if Louis Pasteur walked into the lab, he'd probably recognize it still. So they, they haven't advanced in, in quite the ways that you make, you might uh, hope. So I'm gonna describe several immunoassay strategies and just show you where, where I think the growth points are. So here's one. You've heard about, I think, uh, plasmonic sensors. So this is a grating plasmonic sensor uh, using uh, ultra deep, small sub uh, wavelength separation, separation uh, a grid uh, activated by a, 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 a tunable laser. There's a bioprinting pattern. And this is what, I, what I'm trying to explain on this one is that when you have an antibody and it binds and you change the dimension of this de facto metamaterial, you change the resonance angle for uh, the, the, the maximum reduction in reflection. And the point I'm making is that if you create a structure like that, you end up with a reagent-free immunoassay capability. And this particular one was used for troponin. One immunoassay, which is what we need to measure very quickly in somebody who's had a heart attack. Here's another version. This is another variant. Uh, this is very biased, my own personal you know, interest in, in what I think is gonna move. This is surface plasma resonance, where hopefully most of you know about. There's an intensified field at an interface uh, with, with, with light maximization, energy maximization. But the difference here is there's the metamaterial. It is sub uh, wavelength gold rods, which uh, act as a continuum and what's the point of me telling you about it? Here's the point, here's the punchline. So the first one was about reagentless immunoassay. This is about small molecule surface plasma resonance. We cannot do large molecule surface plasma resonance at the moment because the refractive index impact of binding is negligible with small molecules, can't do it. But this rearrangement of a metamaterial to give you ultra high res sensitivity allow these people to get hold of a small molecule biotin bound to, to avidin as it happens. And if you can do that with a metamaterial, then you've got access to small molecule drugs, vitamins and hormones, you're in business. That would really open up a big area. And the other thing is our better understanding of the kinetics of binding, because we don't really know that much about unmodified kinetics of binding of small to large molecules without reagents. So that's another example. Now, I think one of the pre previous speakers talked about um, uh, chiral molecules, and that's all very interesting and very nice. I, I need to give you a bit of realism about chirality. Um, so this is, there are a lot of work going on in this area using nanoscale chiral arrays, for example. This is a particular, I thought, caught my mind, which is a name of volcano array. As you can see, a mirror image, chiral structures, and they've been coated with gold silver to create plasmonic interfaces. And uh, depending on whether you've got left uh, or right circularly polarized light, you, you end up with a, a circular dichroism um, signal. I think there's something similar to a previous speaker's slide. And based on whether it's left or right orientated, you have a very interesting mirror image signature. Now I got to tell you for free, you are not going to do molecular binding that's chiral with this. These are nanostructures, they're not molecular structures. If you're lucky, you might be able 
to get a molecular imprint in there of a molecule and then and resolve, I don't know. But then there's no point ha having the chiral structures. Here's my take on where I think you can get some use out of this. If you mingle these and you functionalize one but not the other, you may have a powerful way of separately integrating a reference surface against a measurement surface. That is the fundamental need in biological measurement. You've got to have a reference that backs off background interferences and background by incompatibility. That's an important capability. This is a bit like a previous figure you've got. This is a, essentially a, a chiral um, optical um, uh, absorbance um, uh, planar array. And this is another version, which is a staggered rotated silver cross array. And basically, uh, light goes through, and you've got um, a differentiate between right and left polarized light. You can even get yourself with particular polarization a negative refractive index, all very nice, all very exciting. Uh, but what are you going to do with it? I, again, I don't think you're going to get molecular resolution. Where I suggest you can use this is in using uh, creating a reference and possibly with a metamaterial with negative RI, you might get a higher sensitivity than, than has been the case so far. Now in my game, this is what I've been working with most of my life, which is implantable sensors, there's a glucose commercial implantable sensor somewhere in tissue linked to a pump. And why are we doing it? We're doing it because we, biology, diabetic, non biotics all of us are unstable. And this is glucose in the diabetic, and you can see it's wobbling around. That's why we monitor. Um, the reason to do it is to bring ourselves into better control, the patient is in better control. But the problem is in tissue, you're into never, never land. You don't know what's artifact, you don't know what's real, there's no reference method. And I've been uh, battling bioincompatibility problems most of my life. In my case, this is an implantable oxygen sensor in people undergoing exercise, and you see paradoxical changes in oxygen. Uh, I won't bore you with, with the details of that, but, but there, there are un instabilities you can track. It's very exciting. So most of my life, I've dealt with sensors that foul. And to try and reduce the fouling, I've used recessed tip electrodes. And these are implanted. And shock horror, this is blood glucose. And this is my wonderful recessed tip electrode. And there's no comparison. And what that has taught us is tissue behaves, this is tissue implanted sensors, tissue behaves differently to blood. And uh, we better understand the physiology. We actually, and this may be of use to you more generally for implantables, is that if you incorporate a fluid flow structure with your implant, you change the fluidity of tissue, and there you change the crosstalk of glucose here between blood and tissue, and you can see there's equivalence between blood and tissue, and there is no incompatibility problem. It's all disappeared. And my challenge and request to you in the metamaterial world is, first of all, to say to you that biocompatibility is complicated, is nasty, it dumps an awful lot of biopolymer on, my, on your surface, whether it's blood or tissue. And to back that off, you're gonna either have to do what I did with fluid flow, or here's my request to you. How about considering a metamaterial system, such as uh, 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 these, these ring, uh, split ring resonators, in order to track Biofouling. I thought this is really interesting. You've got here a, a bio, uh, in effect, a biofouling detector array, quite small, which is tracking the formation of a polymer film on the surface. You're seeing a resonance angle for, in effect, uh, a plasmon uh, based on reflectance measurement. You're seeing that shift. My challenge to you is if you can track a fouling interaction like that at the tip of my sensor, in vivo or in vitro, you may really be helping my, my, my own uh, world, as it were. Um, now, I, I suspect there may have been some talk, and I don't know, I didn't join it, of saying, the hell with all of this, let's just do non-invasive biochemistry, guys. I honestly say to you, I don't think it's the answer. It, spectroscopically, glucose have been lousy, it's a weak, weak chromophore, um, but people have tried to use radio frequency to interrogate body dielectric. Yes, Glucose does change fluid dielectrics. You can see a dielectric change based on S11 
uh, response, um, uh, reflection uh, response. And it's all very nice in distilled water. You can make a fluid flow, microfluidics, whatever. And this enterprising research group in the UK tried to do this in vivo. There's a patient uh, or, or subject had this, this um, uh, uh, split ring um, uh, arrangement, metamaterial on the abdomen, and they saw tracking glucose following oral glucose. There's tissue. I'm sorry, you're going to find me a very brave man to say that you were tracking real glucose. You can't, I, in my view, cannot do chemistry of glucose without chemistry. So here's the first question. Was it really glucose? You don't really know. Was it other things? Equally possibly humidity, hydration, temperature. So I, I don't think that's the way to go. There is another interesting enterprising way to look at uh, uh, um, metamaterials. And I thought this is another angle on diagnosis, which is imaging. This is um, a laser pairing with thermally uh, sensitive uh, metamaterials. Um, again, uh, split ring resonators, an array of them, they're paired up. And what they do is they heat up a little bit uh, like the web telescope when there's a little bit of light goes on. If you get the right array, this is tumor, this is normal tissue, you've got a very different uh, a frequency based thermal heating. So you're basically measuring transmission using terahertz. So there's a terahertz link to this. And what do you see? Metamaterials were showing pixels at a particular frequency, get the frequency right, and this is cancer tissue showing heated up metamaterial and non heated up material. So you may have a spatial resolution if you do metamaterials in the right way. The other kind of interesting thing is all about imaging. So I thought this is really exciting. And this is metamaterial, no more, no less. Zigzag copper, sub radio frequency um, uh, spacing, and you can have the option of getting at magnetic dipoles, electric dipoles. And here's how you can do NMR with that. You have highest hypersensitivity magnetic field. You can pick a, a, uh, uh, an RF frequency, which is appropriate to different uh, nuclear uh, components. The famous ones are P31 and protons. And these, what these people did was to combine the arrangement of the metamaterials, combined P31 and proton profiles to get not only spectra in tissue, this is calf, and the metamer could, metamaterials. Sorry, sorry about Pankaj, can uh, kindly sort of conclude in a couple of minutes? Yeah, can, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, thank you. So there, there it's, it, 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 you, you've got a spectrum of P31, which is very unusual. You can also, <coughs> with the metamaterials, get at higher sensitivity very quickly in the conventional NMR machine, uh, higher sensitivity just proton, and there's an example of before and after the, uh, in this case, is a, a, a brass resonant array. And you can also use metamaterials for focus uh, heating of cancer tissue. Uh, the technology isn't the problem. The problem is tissue being a very uncertain area to operate. This is heat, which is sort of smudged. So my last slide is say to you, here are the opportunities. I don't think these are entirely opportunities. They're my wish list. I ask you, move to biopolymers, get away from bio biomolecules for sensing, help me with biocompatibility control. We may get to like the phosphorus thing, multi-parameter images. And what about combining diagnostics with treatment as theranostics and better microbial interactions for maybe better, better agents? And by the way, the other cold face problem is, in the end, you're going to have to comply with standards if you're using material interfacing with the body. Sorry to go over a little bit time, Chairman, but that's the end of me. Thank no, you. That, that's excellent. No, thanks very much. You, you finished exactly on time. For, thank you for a very ex interesting, excellent presentation. So um, what we're going to do for the next sort of um, a half an hour, we've got until probably um, 10 past 12. We sort of started a little bit late um, and we were allowed to go up to about 10 past 12, I think. Uh, address some of the questions. There may be a question among the um, speakers as well as some which has been raised by the delegates. So I'm going to start with the first one and then I'll pass on my colleague, Matt Chapman. 
could raise the second one. I've got the first six in front of me. The first one, um, you know, is all to do with net zero and uh, what are the sustainability implications for medical product containing metamaterial? Can they be more difficult to recycle, reuse? Can they have a, la a larger carbon footprint with healthcare um, system like the NHS um, starting to look at net zero targets? And uh, I was just gonna invite uh, maybe, Thomas, do you want to um, comment on that from the industrial sort of perspective? Have you considered that question, that issue at all? And then others could comment if you wish. Yeah, actually, for us, uh, I mean, even outside the medical applications, we make other types of films. And actually, one of the key benefits we offer is that they are more like environmentally friendly and sustainable because we're tr you're trying to make things thinner. Uh, you can have less materials. Like in the optics, when you compactify, you end up using less less materials at the end. Now, in the medical space specifically, it really depends if we're talking about a device, a system, or a, like a, a consumable, uh, basically. Uh, the, and then it depends what's the lifetime. I mean, usually in the medical devices that end up in clinics, in hospitals, or like the MRI accessories, uh, I explained usually this last, you know, they're made to last many years, you know, they're not as many consumables. So, uh, and also the metamaterial is usually a small component there. So I, th I don't think it's a big concern uh, for systems or, or devices. Now, I think it's more of an issue when we talk about consumables like a search film or substrate or you know a, a biosensor that might be used for uh, like briefly and then it's to be disposed. Uh, there are actually already you know regulations in place that uh, you know if you want to launch it commercially, you have to comply with requirements about toxicity and that the materials are relatively easy, disposable and so on, especially in Europe, that's very, very common now. Uh, that being said, I think there is a burden on uh, us, on the metamaterial designer to try to you know, minimize the raw materials uh, used because at the end of the day, it, it all starts from that, right? But I think we are in the correct direction as, as, as a film, as a group, because we are, we are talking about like surfaces and thin uh, layers. So I think in the medical space, and when we talk about like 2D meta surfaces, meta materials, and these substrates, uh, it's easier to have a low environmental impact. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Demos. Um, any other comments? I hope that answered that question, but any other comments from other speakers before we go to the second question? Um, I think, uh, as Thomas said, uh, uh, you know, the disposable, there's compliance issues. In, in particular, I can only sort of say from my experience with these sort of what we've made disposable plasmodics as well, the materials are essentially all what are still commonly used. It's just how we structure them. In our case, for instance, it's polycarbonate, uh, and we could potentially look at using more biocompatible sort of polymers as well. Um, uh, it's just a matter of changing it, and the rest is just metals, films. So they kind of go through the same process as most, and probably less uh, problematic than, for instance, semiconductors and chips, uh, to be fair. Thank you, Afa. Yeah, I think I'm going to ask my colleague, Matt um, Chapman, to raise the second question, and then I'll go to the third. So between us, we cover as many as we can. Matt, would you like to um, raise the second question, please? Sure, Matty. Just to say, uh, we have about half a dozen questions. So thank you to uh, yeah. those who put the questions forward. Uh, I should say, I mentioned in chat, a couple I put forward myself just to get the ball rolling, including the sustainability question and the regulatory question, which Pankaj picked up um, towards the end of his presentation. So perhaps we'll leave those uh, till last. But I'll pick up on the second question, which is from Michael Phillips at Renfrew, <coughs> or for Pankaj Vagama, about keeping practical end use in focus, even at the earliest stages of 
low technology readiness level will work. So how do you go about capturing user needs and prototyping, taking account of uh, end use, even at this early stage? Yeah, th thanks very much. And thank you for the, for the question. This is a, a really interesting uh, area, which, which I think should not be a burden, but adds to some of the innovation excitement. My, my, my bias is that whenever you, as very deep thinking scientists, advance a new material or an idea, I would partner straight off with a tame, cold-faced person, the clinician. They are not people who necessarily understand what you're doing or why or how. They don't understand physics. They don't almost nearly care what you're, how you're doing it, as long as they get what they want. But when you present what you're trying to do, either in material or a system, they'll be very critical, very quick. And this is a lovely way of redirecting what you define as your priority question. You may have started with the idea, well, I need a handheld device because I think, you know, everybody in accident emergency must have a device to measure this substance with handheld. But you talk to half a dozen clinicians, you say, actually, no, we don't want that. We want something else. So the simple answer is partner with a, a clinician. Yes, of course, have technologies, but that's not enough. Even a company is not enough. Get hold of clinicians, work it and experience the environment, and then regard the system as important, if not more important, than the material that you're designing. That's the way I would I would define it, Matt. Thank, 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 thank you, you Pankaj. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Pankaj. Any other comments on that question from anybody else before we go to the next one? Okay, I think that question regarding regulatory is an important one, so I'll leave it later as Matt uh, asked for, but I was also going to um, talk about that. Um, but hopefully we still got some time, about 20 minutes anyway. So the next question I'm going to just um, uh, ask um, Afar to uh, comments uh, is that, can you identify what genes are carrying multiple viruses, e.g. scan, um, an obese person or someone with early Alzheimer's. Um, can you comment on that, Afar? And then maybe Pankaj would like Sorry, to Sorry, can I on. ask again, was, was that to do with genes? Yeah. Um, no, um, we could consider putting some sort of, and we're looking into this now, at the moment, immediately, I, uh, I wouldn't want to say yes, we can, um, as to whether we can do this through DNAs. Uh, so you bind a certain strand of DNA and see if you find complementary or RNA or sort of use those mechanisms where they've done these sort of CRISPR techniques and uh, have certain parts of the DNA uh, binding to what's in your sample. Um, so all of that's uh, uh, being done at the moment and that one way of doing it. But I, I mean, looking at what I know from PCR technologies coming out, if you want to go into more being more gene specific, you know, you'd want to go down the route of PCR kind of techniques, really. Um, and, and so there are quite a few technologies coming out. So would I aim this towards that? Possibly, but the, I know for a fact that it'd be very difficult to compete. Uh, this is a sort of chemical assay. It's, it's more of a, a immuno assay or an ELISA kind of assay. And for that kind of stuff, you know, PCR is too, too far forward for, for, for looking at that, really, is my view on that, yes. Thanks very much. I don't know whether anybody else would like to make any comments on that question. I, I just a couple of words on that, maybe. Yeah. Sure. sure. Thanks. Yeah. No, I think uh, Dr. Karamula made made a very good point on on all of that. Uh, just to re um, uh, refocus you a bit, though, um, I think the question was a bit about disease, uh, Alzheimer's, and so forth. Where we've got our fingers burnt is the hope that there was a gene for a disease X and that's how we get away with it. Um, we haven't succeeded. I mean, diabetes, they found so many genes they don't know what to do with. Uh, Alzheimer's, we don't even know how it works, let alone figure out what the gene is. Cystic fibrosis is a, is a genetic disease, yet there are about 90 genes involved. So there is no simple uh, uh, doctor's office capability that, that is reasonable for, for this area. Were that to be the case, were there to be one 
disease where there was a very focused specific gene, then the, then the bottleneck is not the detection. There are hundreds of detection technologies as suggested by Dr. Karamula. The problem is amplification and there is no simple amplification trick to do outside the lab. So this is a lab technique. Thank you, Pankaj. Um, yeah. So, could I add on the technology sure. side that there has been some really novel work on combining metamaterials and actually PCR techniques. So the metamaterial uh, helps induce the amplification and also becomes the sort of sensor. And um, we've been sort of, that, that is potentially one of the future things. But again, very much like he suggested, it's a lab-based thing. But interestingly, uh, their company is now making PCR systems like USB size or devices. Um, I think that's where potentially things come. Again, they still take take some time. They're not immediate. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. I agree. Yeah. yeah, I think we're seeing um, some use of metamaterial in enhanced MRI imaging and, as you said, in PCR, et cetera. So, Matt, would you like to raise the next question, if you like, please? Yes, sure. And just to mention, uh, Mehdi, uh, in the chat, I think one or two people are struggling to find the, the Q&A box. So as our colleague Olivia said, if you just want to put your question into the chat, then Olivia will be able to pick it up from there. But if you can find the Q&A box, that would be great. I think the next question is aimed primarily at Temos from Meta, and it's a, a commercial one about the level of investment needed to get technologies to market. I guess that's going to be highly variable depending on the the product concern, but do you have any general comments, Temos, you'd like to make there about um, anything particular to metamaterials and commercialization on the cost? Yeah, there is a short answer and a long answer. Short answer is about $70 million. Like if you just want to get a sense of the scale to get a medical device, uh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, now, the long answer is that <clears throat> this depends a lot uh, obviously on the type of device, like if you're making simple consumable only, you don't need that much. But if you're thinking about a full fledged medical uh, device to be used in a clinical setting, uh, you know, it, it is in the tens of millions. I already mentioned in my presentation that just the, the FDA, I mean, from the moment Let's say you have a prototype, you know, done and is working in the lab. From that to get it certified, five, ten k path is on average thirty million, and the PMA is is a hundred million to do all the trials, regulatory and such. Uh, on top of that, there are issues with manufacturing. Uh, it's uh, if 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 a company is planning to do manufacturing in house, that's a whole other tens of millions probably investment that needs to be uh, set up. Uh, in the medical space, a solid path is to, to work with an established medical device manufacturer. So bring the technology up to a good prototype demo level, maybe even have a few sales, uh, but then pass it over with uh, to someone more experienced. This happened, for example, recently on the glucose space in the UK with uh, the Freestyle Libre, like non metamaterial tech, but they got it up to a level that did a few sales, certified it, and then uh, Abbott came in, you know, uh, bought the technology, and then they can take over, you know, manufacturing, distribution, sales, or all this expansion. Um, so for a younger small company, that's probably a, a better path that can also minimize the costs. Uh, you, you don't have to do all the manufacturing in-house. You can get help in the regulatory. Uh, and then it depends really how much control you want to have over your device. Like if, if you give it externally, you share some of the costs, but you won't have as much uh, control. So then it's, it's strategic. Um, yeah, so just to summarize, yeah, it is a painful, complex process. Yeah, it is not easy and it's not something that, uh, especially if for academics, let's say, like it's not something you can do on, on your own or even in your group, you know, you do need a commercial partner uh, for sure, unless you really want to quit your job. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank, thank you. Any other comments on that? Okay. Just going to go to the next question. We still got another ten minutes or so left. Um, 
It's an important question, I think, um, Matt raised, and I also I wanted to comment on that, uh, working on medical biomaterial for many years and medical devices, I think the um, regulatory aspects of um, introducing new uh, material into the healthcare is very important. And some of you know that um, it has to be a lot of polymers been using medical devices, but they have to comply depending where it goes, what type of devices, different sort of um, qualifications, you know, and some of them to start with, you have to comply with um, ISO 10993 and, and, and also USB class six. And, in, you know, I think some of you touched base on regulatory issues and also um, in terms of toxicity of, um, or non-toxicity of uh, metal material. So um, uh, probably, you know, um, Tim was, I had in one of his slides um, addressing some of the regulatory challenges. We can start with you, Timos. And um, this question is there, are there any specific regulatory consideration for metamaterial medical products? I think in a way we covered that, but if you like to make more comments on that regarding that question. Yeah, regulatory specifically, you know, first it needs to be included mm -hmm. early in the process, like a plan uh, for that. Like again, metamaterial or not is 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 irrelevant. But if the application is medical, mm -hmm. it's good to have <clears throat> even like get some consultant early on and some medical expert in house explain you know what's going on and get advice on that. Uh, it's kind of like doing your taxes, tax planning. <laughs> uh, now, the, uh, there is nothing specific to metamaterial that would change this process. Actually, the, the 510K rules, for example, have been the same since the 1970s when this system was first introduced. So the rules haven't changed. Uh, um, one of the basic things they want to you have to prove is how is the device safe? So it doesn't matter what technology you have, uh, metamaterial or not, but we need to present data that it is safe and it doesn't pose risk to the user. Or if it does pose some risk, like in our glucose sensor, you know, we're sending electromagnetic radiation into the body. And then we, we claim that, you know, the metamaterial will enhance that. Uh, we put more energy through. So that's potentially a risk that needs to be identified in the documentation. And then mitigation plans, things like uh, we did calculations and is well beyond the safety, health safety limits for the particular wavelengths, uh, or that there is a fail safe mechanism that uh, will kick in if for whatever reason it goes higher. You know, there are things like that. It doesn't matter what it is, but it needs to be reported when filing for regulatory. I don't know, uh, Pankaj or any other person would like to comment on, on that question? I mean, absolutely. I think, Thomas, you've, you've got it. You've got it absolutely well focused. This is just exactly what a company ought to do. Us crazy academics go around thinking, I got a new material. Wow, I, the world is mine. It's just crazy. Um, and, and so beyond the system, you have to work out how it interfaces with the environment. <clears throat> and the environment is the patient inside and out. And the environment is including right through to degradation, recycling, environmental toxicity. All of those are getting really serious stuff. And so I, I, I think it's all part of the package. But the wonderful opportunity that I think that you have in metamaterials is that, if I may say so, it's all about a physical profile and organization in 3D, let's say. So you can aim for a boring traditional material, but with a new architecture. And therefore, material-wise, you don't face any new barriers from FDA. And that's exactly what we did with our biosensors. We just didn't use any new material, just changed them configurally, which, which is your way forward. If you have a new material, entirely new material for a metamaterial, you've added a decade of development time before you got through the safety. So that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, actually, the, the main uh, 
a, a decision on whether you can take this 510k versus a new device is how similar is it to anything previously done. So if you're able to claim uh, a predicate, as they call it, so you claim that, okay, I have this device that actually works very similar to, to something else. Uh, yeah, that, that accelerates a lot, the development. Yeah, sure. I mean, it depends of, uh, also, as you all know, uh, on what type of application is going to go in, whether the implantable or an imaging site externally or um, other instruments. Anyway, um, any other comments on that before we go maybe another question? So you've got another seven minutes or so left. Okay, Matt, would you like to raise another question, please? Yes, Mehdi, just to say there's a general uh, question about how uh, attendees can contact the panel. Uh, I would say that in some cases, the panel may include their contact details in their slides, so obviously they're happy for you to approach them directly. Um, if not, please feel free to contact myself or Mehdi, and we'll try to make a connection if you'd like to get in touch with one of the panel members. In, in terms of the other questions, there's only one other specific question I can see which hasn't been raised yet, which is, um, again, for Temos at Meta, I appreciate that Temos has been there. Requested quite a bit here, but it's specifically about the uh, the resolution enhancement that was achieved in the Mammawise uh, system through the use of meta services. Uh, whether you can comment on that, please. Uh, yeah, so the radio wave imaging, this enhancement is not meant to be better than like an MRI or a, a CT scan. Like the the it, it won't it will never probably be as detailed. The purpose of that system is to have a portable and quick to get image of the brain. So make it more like a classification, like is there something there, let's say at least uh, five millimeters or 10, 10 millimeters wide that was not there uh, before. And also in the brain to be able to tell apart an ischemic versus the, uh, uh, the, the two types of, of, of stroke, uh, uh, because this has different treatment uh, once you enter the hospital. So actually this device is aimed more for the ambulance and a portable uh, setup. Uh, the resolution won't be better than, let's say, MRI, but it will be able to classify a lot faster and on the way to the hospital, whether there's something there or not. That's the initial... Uh, uh, approach for this device type of devices. That's great. Thank, thank, thanks very much. Any other comments on that particular question from anybody else? Okay, th th thank you. Yeah, I think we're going towards the final sort of few minutes of the time we've got left. Um, yeah, I think um, it's very important as um, uh, uh, you know, Matt mentioned that um, if there are, you know, uh, any question we could um, make the connection part of our role daily um, tasks are really to encourage new collaboration opportunities and facilitate um, new collaboration between academic um, and companies and I had one question for Timos as well because I think um, in terms of collaboration you know when you go to people like Innovate you know, UK funding you need a company lead and often it's very important to find a a company in metamaterial or metamaterial devices that can work with academics to address some of the challenges or new approaches. But how does it work with your company? I know you know you may be inundated with requests for collaboration, but how does it work? And are you open to suggestions to consider new collaboration opportunities? Actually, specifically in the UK, but also in, in the other countries too, we, it's common that we go together with a university professor and yeah, we are the commercial lead. Um, it is some, uh, so we're happy to do that and Innovate UK funded uh, grants, uh, I think we've done seven or eight of them in the past 10 years and with exception on one, they were all, were all collaborative with universities. Uh, it's a bit tricky sometimes if it's a new market application. Um, 
we might not have all the like the business data behind to back it. So there are certain application areas that we are interested in. We have market data to support it, the business case. Uh, but if it's a new idea, new application area that, that needs more uh, work and correctly, the funding agencies want to see a, business, a good business case be, before. So we try to help with that, work together with the, uh, the academics. Um, if I can make a final comment on this, that uh, particular to the medical device development is that it's very difficult to try to replace existing established uh medical devices uh you know in our case like the x-ray mammography for example or it's uh, uh, uh you could do that with radio wave imaging and metamaterials but if your claim is oh i'm going to take this and replace with a uh, a completely new system like good luck with that you know it mm. will take mm. many years yeah. unless there is a a very critical advantage that's like order of magnitude better. So in the case of glucose, you go from invasive to non-invasive. Okay, maybe you know there is a huge difference in the pain. Maybe you can display someone uh, quickly. But if your technology is like you know twenty percent, fifty percent better, uh, you need to find another niche to launch it first. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's very important point to, to raise, yeah, I think in terms of improving the existing um, instrument imaging PCRs and others using metamaterial, I got lots of application. I was involved in using focus ultrasound in treating brain tumors, and there are some potential using metamaterial in cancers, in stroke, I think others, which we could pick up um, separately as a follow-up um, discussion anyway. So any other comments from anybody else? I'm just going to make some final sort of a few words before we finish. Any other comments from anybody else before we finish? If not, I'm just going to thank you, all our speakers. I'm grateful to the time and effort you put in. Hopefully, this will open up some new collaboration opportunities. As Matt said, he will be supporting any new collaboration and try what we can do to really um, address the challenges that are, are, are there. And uh, I also would like to thank all our delegates who participated um, for this session. And um, um, last but not least, my um, colleagues, um, Olivia Brown, who's um, been looking after this session as the event manager, Matt Chapp and my other colleagues. And, um, and thank you all and hope we look forward to finding a way of working with you and um, we will um, make introduction whenever is necessary with, uh, with our delegates or other people who would like to talk to you. And then we can hopefully take those up with our, our supports. And I will thank you and have a good day. For the rest of the day, you may join other sessions. Otherwise, I'm going to close this, um, this meeting. Uh, Matt, is there anything else I missed? I, I missed? No, nothing further, Mehdi. I think you've covered everything. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Have a good day. I'm going to close this because I know Olivia is going to lead to other session. Thank you.